everyone. Thank you for the warm welcome. I'm fully aware that I'm the only thing standing in between you and Rain Fishkin, and then you and alcohol, so I'll, I'll try to make this as bearable as possible. Okay, so a little bit about me and the company that I work at. I'll try to keep this um, not too overly promotional, but uh, we are a data and marketing company for industrial companies, so companies in that manufacturing space. And um, we're actually uh, over 120 years old. Our department, what I'm going to be talking about specifically today, our marketing services department, we actually got our start just six or seven years ago. Um, so I'm going to focus on the growth that we saw in those last couple of years. So here's our team. We're super happy, um, pumped to deliver all these services down here. Um, so there's about 42 of us now, and we have over 350 clients. They're spread out. Um, we offer website designs. Uh, I think at any given time we're managing about 200 website designs. Um, SEO services, and then for our higher tier industrial uh, companies, we have, offer full inbound content marketing services. So what I want to talk to you about today is the S word. So this S word is thrown out a lot with investors and decision makers, and that of course is the word scale. So whenever you talk about all the growth that you're seeing, um, you know, one of the questions you will hear is, well, does it scale? So are there any, anyone in uh, SaaS, software, software as a service companies here? Okay, just a few. Okay, so bear with me on this next slide. But um, when we think of SaaS companies, we tend to get a little jealous, right? Because for them, the way we see it, you know, we have to go through all this manual creative work to execute on our deliverables. And SaaS, you know, at the end of the day, they don't have to do that manual creative work. So we tend to get a little bit jealous. Um, obviously, it's not quite this simple, but um, I do think, you know, if, don't leave the room if you're in SaaS. I think there's some good uh, information here for you, too. So let's go into our story time. Um, it was about two years ago, and our marketing department was doing really well. And by really well, I mean we had good services. We were uh, creating real opportunities for our clients, real sales opportunities. We were profitable, and we had a smart driven staff of about 25 people. So I'm not really setting a good, juicy story up for you guys. Um, there has to be something wrong here, right? Mm -hmm. So here's what the issue was. Our revenue and staff was growing because our client list was growing, but our net profit wasn't. We were stuck, and when we looked into it a little bit more, we realized there were three reasons behind this. So here's the first problem. This is essentially what our product line looked like, right? If it, was, if it was marketing, we did it, and if it wasn't marketing, we still actually did it. Um, so what we were doing, you know, we were still in those early startup phases, but um, you know, I think at our lowest point, we uh, offered two brand mugs and send them out to our clients. So definitely doesn't fit within our digital marketing uh, expertise there. So if you think about that uh, kind of custom program, the idea behind it is good, right? Like you tell us what your budget and your goals are, and we'll set you up with a very custom program tailored to meet those goals. Um, oh, I forgot <laughs> mugs is squeezed in there too. <laughs> um, but obviously the issue here, there, there were two big issues associated with this. The first one was that it was very confusing to our clients, right? Or to our prospects. We would show up and we'd say, hey, uh, we offer all these things, what do you want? And they'd say, well, I don't know what I want. I want you to tell me what I should get based off of uh, what you see in the data. So it was confusing. Um, and the other big issue was that we, uh, our sales process was pretty long. Because if you can imagine, when we, when we show up with a menu like this, we have to custom quote a program, and um, it unfortunately was not just the sales staff that was up, uh, doing this, that custom quoting. There was a lot of work on the production side. We had to work with our sales team for every single prospect that came through, um, because at the end of the day, the production team are the marketing experts. So the sales team would come to us and say, hey, um, here's the client, here's their budget, here's what their goals are, what do you think we should put together? So a lot of resources spent putting together these custom packages and our sales cycle was extremely long. So that was our first problem. Second problem, when your revenue grows, your expenses tend to grow with it. So this is really scaling at its most basic level, right? Um, so let me show you what I mean here. Um, if we figured out that one person could manage 10 accounts, that logically means that if you hit 11 accounts, then um, you'd have to hire another person to manage that, right? And so on, if you go past those, you have to three, have to hire more and more people on that. 
So you might see where I'm getting at with this. Um, what happens in those time periods where you have uh, 15 accounts or 35 accounts? Those are the time periods that your bottom line is really hurting because you have account managers that don't have a full plate of work. So your lines start to look like this, where your revenue goes up and your costs go up with it. It's not that nice hockey stick curve that we like to see. And finally, we're going to hit the last problem here, and that's office space. So whether you're in New York or San Francisco or New Hampshire, um, but especially if you're in New York or San Francisco, you know that rent is a real thing, and, and you have to think about it. So um, <laughs> if you don't, you're going to end up looking for one of these. And these are bunk desks. Um, they're a real thing. If you Google bunk desks, they actually exist. So we were in a meeting. Um, we were in a meeting at one point, saying like, "Well, we're running out of space. Like, you could try to renovate the cubicles and open up more space, or we could open up a new, a new location. What should we do?" And jokingly, someone found this, and like, I guess we're going to have to get bunk desks. Um, but really, like, this was, you know, it was kind of a thing that we were laughing at, but also kind of like dying a little on the inside. Like, all right, what are we going to do about our space problem? So those are the three big problems that we had. So let's look at what some of the solutions that we were to tackle them. And obviously this is where it gets into automating and packaging. So the first crazy idea, what if we made it easy to sell and easy to onboard? So if you remember that Chinese menu that I showed you, what if we made it very easy and not confuse our clients? And then what if when, uh, when we did make the sale, when it came to our production team, we made it very easy for us to start right away? So we looked at our old program and we realized we can't say that we do all the things anymore. Right? There's too many issues associated with that and a lot of our clients are fit in that small and medium sized business area. Because of that, a lot of them would come to us and they didn't have the best websites. So as you probably know as marketers, if you don't have a very high performing website, all these other things don't mean much because all these other things are trying to drive people to your website. So we repackaged everything into these five core services with websites as a foundation. So when a client came to us, one of the first things we would pitch would be a website because we would say, hey, we could uh, put together a really good marketing program for you, but if we, all the traffic that we drive to your website, if it doesn't convert, then it's not gonna mean anything. So we would set websites as the foundation there, and then we'd offer a series of packages and these increase in prices as you go. Um, and SEO is the baseline of all of these packages. Because again, when you're in that SMB realm, you're going to need to have traffic as a very baseline. Um, Jeff, you probably, I don't know where Jeff is now, but Jeff, you probably know that um, you can't even run A-B tests if you don't get enough traffic going to your site. That A-B test is going to sit running forever because you're not going to get enough of the statistical significance. So what happens when you access all the programs? For us, everything got easier and faster. So on the sales side, it got way easier to explain what we offer. Clients understood what we needed immediately. When we closed the sale and got to onboarding, our team didn't have to sift through contracts and see, okay, what did this person get? What's included in their program? We immediately knew and we could get started right away. And then finally, when we got to the renewal stage, it was also way easier to start talking about what's gonna happen for next year. Um, one of the reasons behind this is we would actually train our team, our account managers, to start planting that seed early. So again, if you have a website, um, you're going to be the project manager putting together all the deliverables for the website. And then when, uh, when the client would ask us, hey, this website's going to increase my traffic, right? We'd say, well, yes, um, you know, theoretically, because we're putting it into a responsive design for you, you're definitely going to see some type of bump. But if you want ongoing traffic increases, that's where our SEO program comes into play. So planting those seeds early, um, you know, don't turn your account managers into salespeople, but at least let them know about that opportunity so that when it comes to renewal, you're not just shoving all that in front of them. They've been hearing about that for months. So here's how we got there. A couple things had to happen. We had to start at a very tactical level. So you know that there is a lot that goes into SEO. For us, we had to look at everything that we were doing, and we had to look at real results that were coming from our clients. So we sat down and looked at our SEO program with the results and, the, and all the deliverables that offered the uh, highest performance. The first thing that we noticed we were doing was we were um, spending a lot of time trying to get backlinks from whatever site we could. And backlinks are great, but as, again, many of you probably know, domain authority is key here. 
So if you have a low uh, domain authority, if you're spending time um, pushing all those backlinks onto low domain authorities, it actually doesn't even mean as much as if you just get one link on a high domain authority. So we got rid of that. The next thing we noticed is uh, we were creating con blogs on about a monthly basis for a lot of our clients, um, sometimes two or three times a month. And we realized if we didn't have a, strat a strategy set in place for those blogs, those pages were actually going to start competing with each other. So if you think about it, if you write a page about metal stamping, uh, the three types of metal stamping, and then you write another page about progressive metal stamping, those pages are going to compete against each other because those keywords are very similar. So we got rid of that. And then finally, the Lipstick on the Pig websites, like I mentioned, we used to see a lot of clients coming to us with uh, websites that just couldn't convert, some of them not even responsive, or they were built into CMSs that were very hard to edit, or they weren't coded correctly. Um, and we realized, you know what, we can do all the content and all the backlinks in the world, and these websites are just going to hit a ceiling really fast because they don't have that basic coding structure set for them. So we got rid of that. So then we looked at some ways that we could actually make SEO a program, a repeatable program for our clients with only the tactics that produce the best results. The first thing, um, many of you are already be familiar with the new pillar content strategy for SEO. Okay, so pillar content it basically means um, a very long page, a pillar page, that describes all of your uh, different service, or it really focuses on one keyword essentially, or one topic. So rather than having a bunch of different content, again, competing for each other, you have that one maybe 1,500, 2,000 word page that explains everything about metal stamping. And Google's actually leaning towards this strategy because if you think about the way you search, if you find that one good article that has everything you need and it has all the great subheads and it's really easy to, to go through and look for the uh, topic that you want, then your, your goal, you don't need to leave that page. And Google realizes that. They see people and they don't want to click around Google all day. They want to find the one article that's going to answer that topic for them. So we picked up that new pillar strategy where we're creating long form content for our clients. Um, and I should have added the case study here and um, I'm happy to send it to you if you want to reach out afterward. But we actually put together a pillar page um, for metal stamping as a keyword. And I keep saying that term and you probably are not super familiar with it, but it's like a very cool thing to do in the manufacturing world. Um, but metal stamping is actually a very difficult keyword to rank for it. And we put together a pillar page for it. Um, I think the page published in October and November, and they're already ranking on page one and spots two and three for different metal stamping keywords. And again, from an SEO terms, that's a very quick response. Second thing is, um, we realize we don't have to just create written content all the time. We can actually look at other forms of content that people might want to consume. So rather than constantly creating and writing content, we started putting together images and infographics and videos for our clients as part of an SEO strategy. And the last thing we did, again, um, for those lips that come to websites, we said, uh, we, we told the clients that they could not do SEO with us unless they were on WordPress. And I know this seems like it's an insane thing to do, but um, we, when we break it down for them, WordPress is actually used by 30% of all websites on the, in the world. We would um, explain that to them. We would explain the security benefits behind WordPress. We would explain, hey, this is the first step of your SEO program. So if a client came to us saying, hey, I want SEO, we would look at their website and say, okay, as part of your SEO strategy, we're going to move your website into WordPress for you. And um, sometimes they get a full redesign that came with it, but sometimes it was just a simple migration where we're rebuilding everything they already have in the WordPress. And even without redesigning it, we would see improvement just by moving CMS platforms. So now 80 to 85% of all of our clients are building WordPress. So the, re the reason that this really works is because, again, these are a solid foundation, and you can add ta tactics to them, but you can't subtract. So if someone comes to us and says, hey, I really like your SEO program, but I only want to do it for six months, we'll say no, we can't guarantee those results. And that's really the key, if, and we're not seeing any pushback to this when we say, honestly, we can't offer this program because we can't guarantee results. Um, our sales team understands it right away, and most of our prospects that we talk to understand it right away. We say, hey, we looked at it, we looked at all of our tactics, we can guarantee results from these tactics. But once you start taking away deliverables in them, it's not going to work as well. 
Um, saying no is key here. Uh, this is how you get um, to the spot that you need to get to. So it means saying no to all these questions, like I just mentioned, can we try a shorter program? Can you build something custom on our website for us? Can you do social media? <coughs> can you um, do less content and more videos? Can you pitch press releases? The answer is no. But no doesn't just mean answer to these questions. It also means turning down clients that are not a fit for your program. And this, this is the hardest part, turning down revenue. Um, when we would get clients who were rude or degrading or wouldn't pay us on time, we thought, well, you know, it's worth it. Like, we need the revenue. It's really not worth it, especially once you start to see people actually leaving your company because of it. So we did learn to say no to um, clients who we identified not being a fit to us. So that was so important, and I wanted to um, have its own slide, but you can't master everything if you want to scale. So you need to identify what you're best at, and you can't kill yourself with products, um, especially products that you're not an expertise at. If you have to continuously train your staff to do new things, if you're not going to be able to scale the things that you are good at. Okay, so second crazy idea here. If you remember that account management problem where, you know, for every 10 accounts that come in, you have to hire a new person on your staff. So second crazy idea is what if we templated repeatable processes? And by that, I, I, I mean a couple of different processes. And we started with our products. So what we wanted here was we wanted our, you know, we're designing, like I said, about 200 websites a year. We want our design and development teams to have a very, um, a very concise procedure that they can follow that's also consistent. So we also wanted them to stay creative, right? Because what you don't want to do is give creative people a template to follow, and you don't want your clients to say, hey, this looks like a cookie cutter website. So we wanted to see how we could template it, but still offer a lot of room for creativity, especially on the design side. <coughs> so we built our own framework in WordPress. And if you're familiar with the term framework, it's essentially just like a templated code. So if you look at these here, these are kind of examples of what a framework would look like. Um, so we would build out different frameworks, we would code them out, and each of these still have a lot of room for design. So the colors have to change, um, we have to offer di different functionality, and we can build endless modules like that. So uh, having them modular is one of the reasons this worked. Um, we can build endless versions of main navigations, and then we can reuse them. And again, all we're switching out is the design. The other reason this worked is actually we are always A-B testing our clients' sites. So when we learn that something works better, we implement it into our framework, and our, as a result, our clients' websites are actually consistently getting better over time. So repeatability didn't stop there. We wanted to make every, all of our processes internally repeatable as well. So what we did was we put together our own wiki. Um, so this is on a free Google site. We basically put together all of our processes, made it very easy for people to look them up. And as a result, if you think about your uh, team growing and hiring, you're going to get a lot of questions. And even if your team isn't growing, you're still going to get a lot of questions. So if you have those processes documented, um, it's very easy for someone to go in there and look them up. And the only way this works is if you can uh, continuously update it. Um, the, uh, the way that I did it was I just baked, I gave everyone edit access. There's no reason not just I should have editing access. There's no reason just the managers should have editing access. Um, make it easy for people to go in and update it. And if they come up with new ideas and you streamline your processes, they can be the ones that go in and update and share with the team, hey, I made this change and now everything's great. So that's our wiki and our, it's a free Google site. The next thing we did was template out our processes in our project management system. So we use Basecamp, but a lot of these are very similar. Uh, I know Asana does this as well. But you can put together a free uh, template, and you can set it up however you want, so that all, whenever a new website project comes in, all I have to do is open up the template, and then start a new project directly from there. This ensures that all of our clients get the same treatment on every website, and we can ensure a same level of quality as well. So this one is actually overlooked, but if you're growing very quickly and if you're hiring almost every other month, um, or if you have a, a turnover, like if you're here in New York City, turnover is very common, especially in marketing and advertising. But um, onboarding and making that repeatable is, is so important, not just from a time aspect in terms of you know, managers having to spend the time to train someone, 
but also to make sure that everyone is, is uh, looking at the same thing and, and has the same goals in the team. You want to make sure everyone is aware of your processes. You don't want people um, talking, saying, oh, I thought it was done this way, I thought it was done that way. Um, you want to make sure everyone's uh, looking at the same thing and, and um, is focused on the same goal. So we broke out in Trello, again, another free tool. I really like free tools. Um, we broke out our uh, onboarding process, and you can see it's by team here. So um, there's like a getting started board, which is um, for everyone. And then we break it, start to break it down by strategist, by website designer, by um, SEO, by design, editing, writing. And if you open up one of these cards, you get information about what that training is going to be. So um, in this one, we linked it to Google Documents. Um, there's, uh, we haven't gotten the videos yet, but we're starting to put together videos. And again, the benefit here is that the hiring manager and anyone else on your team is not going to have to go through those same repeatable trainings. Um, it's already going to be built out in the video. So whenever someone new starts the team, you can just say, hey, here's the track that you need to follow. They can open them up in the Google documents or in the videos. Um, definitely worth noting that you, st uh, you should still have at least a couple of in-person trainings. I think there's a lot of value, especially if they're going to have questions. But um, if you have as much uh, different offerings going on as we do, it is good to have this as a baseline. Uh, repeatable reporting is also is extremely important. Um, and not to dive too deep into this, but um, essentially you don't want to have to spend your time putting together PowerPoints and Excel sheets, right? You want all of that time spent dedicated towards actually executing your programs and working with your clients. So rather than working inside PowerPoint and Excel, we moved everything into cloud-based programs. Um, I think even more importantly than having it be repeatable is having it all in the same place. So, um, you know, we use all of these different tool sets for our clients, and we're able to put them all in the same area depending on what the client buys from us. If you're not, um, I definitely recommend Zapier. Uh, it's also a free tool up to a certain amount of connections, but it basically lets you connect any of these to, into a spreadsheet, and you can have all your data in one place. So we do this for our data studio reports. Um, you can see here, uh, this is like, again, it's a very templated thing, so for all of our SEO clients, we have about 150 of them now. They're all going to be looking at the same thing. Um, so this is great for two reasons. Uh, one, again, we're ensuring a, a consistent level of quality and type of program for all of our SEO clients. But if you're a search analyst, you're also able to look at these quickly and um, across a high level view and determine uh, if, like, what the industry trends are like. So if I'm a search analyst and I'm looking through all my accounts, it's the week that I'm reporting to all of my clients, and I can say, hey, everyone actually has taken a deep dive the past two months. It's very easy to identify that with the uh, data studio. All right, so our last thing, crazy idea number three. What if we kept our most creative task with our most creative people? And again, if you remember that problem with the bunk desks, th this is the one where we're trying to figure out how to avoid um, getting uh, running out of office space. So we had to do a couple of things here. Um, this is a real screenshot of the macro that we use. We don't work on retainer. So what we had to do is break down how long each person is spending on a task for every account. And obviously this is going to vary. It's difficult to do because you're going to have to sit down with a couple of account managers and say, how long does it take you to do this? How long does it take you to do that? And their answer, their first answer is like, well, it varies for clients. So then you have to say, okay, what's the average amount of time does it take you to do this? So there is some work that goes into this, but it, it really pays off because it actually sets the pricing structure for all of our programs. So we break down um, what each task is and how long it takes. So if you're a month one client um, in SEO, this is a snapshot of what you're going to get, and this is the amount of time that, spends, uh, that we spend setting this up for you. So if you notice, we have an hour for a kickoff call, but we start to break it down even further, a half hour for Google Analytics setup, we even put 15 minutes for a screaming frog crawl. So try to remember literally everything that goes on in that because that's what's help, gonna help you determine how long it takes someone to do something. So the way this works out is we figured, okay, it's um, for each account, for one account, someone's gonna spend eight, an average of eight hours a month on that account. And then if you do the math, that person works 160 hours a month. So theoretically, they should be able to hold 20 accounts. And again, this is not perfect. There's obviously going to be some accounts that take more time than others and clients that are different than others. 
Um, you're going to have to account for some buffer time. You're going to have to account for project management time. So the time spent in base camp delegating tasks, the time spent um, replying to client emails. But it works out very well for our staff. Um, you know, we're very much nine to five. Um, nobody's working late hours. Um, so we think that we do have that figured out pretty well. So second step here was to despecialize a little bit. Um, so what we did was our search mark, we had a, a team of PPC analysts and SEO analysts here. And we realized, um, you know, a lot of these have the same clients, right? So these clients would um, buy SEO from us and they worked with an SEO analyst. And then they'd also have PPC with us and work with a PPC analyst. Sometimes the calls would coincide, sometimes they wouldn't. And we realized, you know, if we switch this around so that we have a, a search marketing analyst who can do both of those things, not only does it help us scale, we're spending less time, but it benefits the client pretty significantly. Not only do they have one main point of contact, um, but if you think about it, we can kind of cross-apply the learnings in search and paid. So for example, if, a paid, if this search analyst finds negative keywords that they add to that uh, Google AdWords program, they can say, hey, you know what? Um, we were going to write a blog topic about that keyword, but it sounds like it doesn't make sense to. So this obviously is not going to work with everyone. You can't teach your designers how to do SEO, but um, it does work well for people who are in a similar craft. And our staff really love this idea because for them, it's essentially free career training. A lot of these search analysts wanted to learn on the paid side. It helps them grow in their career down the line. So this is what our search team like. Instead of having an SEO team and a PPC team, we had a search marketing team that's broken down. Um, we like this strategy because, again, we still have um, specialists in each area. We still have a paid specialist. We still have a search marketing, uh, an SEO specialist. Um, but at the end of the day, they're all on the search team. Last thing here, and, and this is what would make decision makers and investors' ears really perk up, is fixed costs and variable costs, and trying to get more costs out in the variable. So are, is, are you guys familiar with the term fixed cost, variable costs? Okay, so basically the, the fixed cost is, is a salary, most salaried employees are fixed. So um, if I'm an employee and I have um, 10 accounts, I'm going to get paid the same amount as if I had five accounts that week. So it doesn't matter what my account load looks like, it doesn't matter how much work I have, I'm still going to get paid for the, paid the same amount every week. So what we did was we identified what we could make variable, and we wanted to keep our most creative work in-house here. So putting together the site map and the design of the website, we figured you know, that's something that we should be doing internally here in New York, because we have some of the brightest minds in New York City here designing websites, and we want to keep it that way. But what we could maybe send out house is uh, the framework that we developed, right? So if you remember, we um, developed a framework where if we send them the design and send them all the content, all they need to do is code it out in WordPress. So we were comfortable with that work going out. And what happens here, and, and when it comes back, we also keep the editing and QC in house. But um, what ends up happening here is for uh, the variable costs, um, if, if something were to happen, right, if we have a bad couple of months or, um, you know, it, the, our, our retention rate doesn't work out that month, we can actually just keep more of that in-house for that time period. So we're not, um, we don't have that time period anymore where we're not doing as well, our bottom line is hurting, because for us, we just stop paying this vendor and we keep having our employees do a full account work. So the, the work that they're doing is a little bit different, a little more, I guess, repeatable and tedious, you could say, but at least, you know, we're not hiring someone and, and they don't have work to do. Okay, so we went through a couple of things. I just want to summarize everything here for you. We came a long way since that cow stuck on a fence slide. Uh, so let's look at the key takeaways. First, make it easy to sell and renew. Your sales team will really thank you and your production team will also thank you. No a la carte menus, the Chinese menus. Uh, second thing, template and automate. Don't forget about onboarding. Um, that's, again, very much overlooked and it's very critical to make sure all your employees are on the same page and to make sure your hiring managers aren't getting bogged down hiring and onboarding rather than actually managing and doing the craft we're supposed to be doing. And then finally, despecialize and outsource. Beware of bug desks. Make sure that that's something that you, you can turn into variable costs and make sure your fixed costs won't get too high. And that's it. So thank you guys. I'd love to connect with you on LinkedIn.